Hello. Hi, can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me well? I can. Awesome. All right. So let's uh, get started. Maybe just uh, do some quick intros here and then kind of like a Basically, set uh, set the tone up for the sessions we're gonna have here. I'll start here. I'm Brian. Um, used to work at Microsoft uh, for about uh, two years, and I uh, was working specifically as a backend and machine learning engineer, and I specialized in building data infrastructure. And I'll just give you a quick recap of what I know so far, and then you can do the intro. But my understanding here is you have uh, at least four years of experience, and uh, you have a software engineering role lined up. And the area you want to focus in in this regard is essentially problem solving and identifying more optimal solutions uh, really quickly, uh, like in all the scene that are extra perspective, so to say. And uh, you also listed operating systems as a specialty you would like to look into, as well as full stack and backend engineering. But yeah, at least in your own words, maybe just run me through what you have lined up, as well as what you're looking to get out of this. Um, okay, yeah. I know I filled out that survey and there's a lot of uh, open like, ended text fields. So uh, yeah, my name is James. I'm a software engineer. Well, I have been at a software engineer since 2014, was at Amazon most of my career. And then part of that was at Seagate working on embedded systems. Um, and then I left Amazon in 20, at the beginning of 2022, just to try something new, uh, went to startup, got laid off and then recently joined uh, as a consultant just to figure out mm -hmm. you know what i want to do because i'm kind of in this this limbo stage of i'm not sure what i want to do but i do enjoy tech in many areas i also really enjoy writing it's just it's, i'm at a, a crossroads in my career that um there's just so many avenues and ways to slice tech careers and tech adjacent mm -hmm. careers that i'm still trying to figure it out um i don't have anything lined up actually i'm on i'm in the process of trying to line them up unless you mean line up meaning i've applied to places but no no uh as of right now i don't have anything lined up so i've had like eight years of professional experience you know over 10 mm -hmm. of just like internships and other stuff if you want to add that but makes sense yeah and I, and I appreciate this kind of transparency is there like a particular reason actually uh, it's listed as standard no uh, never mind i thought it was listed as microsoft but i did list uh, microsoft cool actually because i'm interested in oh, microsoft that's structure just because it's Very nice. completely separate from like other jobs that I've interviewed with in the past. Obviously Microsoft's not a you know a Linux house or you know other <laughs> operating systems. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what most of my career has been, but there's so many things that Microsoft does that's interesting. Obviously it's a very large company and you can't broad brush it like that, but just that culture is something I would like to break into for many reasons. I'm not sure that you know, my biggest restraints and re reservations are okay. communicating that clearly and myself clearly to myself, not that if I can do the job or not, um, but that's half the battle for a lot of people, right? And so how to put my best foot forward. And, so. Yep, and full transparency, you know, I, I'm, I'm actually, I uh, have a very similar journey. I also have about seven, eight years of experience approaching. Uh, I've, pretty much work both in big tech. Like uh, my first uh, foray was basically in my, uh, Microsoft. And then from there, I went to Qualtrics. And I wanted that uh, uh, up in responsibility, so to say. And unfortunately, they had layoffs. And so with the recent advent of uh, AI tools, I kind of decided, OK, let me take a step back, uh, jump back into the startup world. And so I came into this startup. Um, what I'm doing is basically building pretty much every AI service that they'll need for a while. So it's uh, ranged from the you know, stereotypical LLM because everybody's obsessed with that, all the way down to some classical techniques like collaborative filters. But you know, essentially it's been full ownership and now I'm kind of looking to go back to big tech. And one thing I know I'm really good at is actually problem solving, especially in the context of an interview. Like that's the one thing that I feel I usually am very passionate about and I enjoy mentorship even more so than going through interviews themselves, but I've also made it a habit to actually go through interviews even when I'm not looking to change a job, uh, job just to get a sense of what questions they ask, uh, what the process looks like, because clearly I'm trying to also make a career of that. And so hopefully 
I will have tips as we at least go through these sessions that will also help you in that regard, just to make sure that if you want the option, you can get it. Because that's usually the core goal for me, at least as an engineer. I really wish we all had the ability to just jump whenever we want and easily go through this process. Because frankly, interviews suck, but hopefully yeah. this will you know, uh, be of benefit in that regard. And maybe it also clarified, I, I, I'm assuming you've done this kind of interview before, given you at Amazon. Like, have you ever like gotten a sense of what you're good at and what you struggle with? And just to make sure we can also drill down and uh, focus the set of interviews we have, we have appropriately. Um, so are you asking what I'm good at or strengths in, in the context of interviews or just generally as a... Yeah, we can, an engineer. Yeah, we can speak of it generally, uh, even even generally speaking. Uh, but in the context of interviews, because I'm assuming that's the whole purpose of this. But I yes. think if you if you let's say <laughs> okay. have a domain you're targeting, I can think of interviews in that context. Yeah. Okay. I, I, there's a few. I mean, some of it just comes down to practice. Mm -hmm. I guess. So let's I'll, I'll roll it back a little bit. I'm, I'm fine for the most part mm -hmm. on behavioral and like explaining myself. And I mean, I got to do the due diligence to map culture like paradigms to my experiences mm -hmm. and whatnot and explain how you know my seniority but when it comes down to like like system design in those moments like system design problems and then you know novel coding interview questions like i'll, I'll get stumped by simple ones obviously these aren't skills that like you i mean we tell ourselves we're not going to let those you know fatigue and atrophy but they do inevitably like the Amazon interview process was grueling and I got through that, but it took a lot of practice. <laughs> um, you know, system design is something that I do, I did and do all the time. But, you know, when you're in a situation where it's an hour, it, I just struggle to break it down and treat it as a pair programming session or a discussion more than I'm trying to like find the right answer. And same with coding problems. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, maybe they asked me some you know, write some function that does some basic conversion. And then I get locked up on the fact that I'm like, I don't know how to, what that conversion is. Instead of me talking to them about that, like I just sit there and kind of finagle myself. So it's really just practicing with the framework of like creating a discussion, working through the problems, obviously getting them right is one thing, but it's, it's really making it a, a conversation that I'm struggling with. And also just how to present my approaches in a way that seems that I'm not rambling. Sometimes I'm like, I think it's this, and then I double, you know, double back and say, I don't know. And then what do you think? You know, and it, obviously it depends on the interviewer on the other side on whether or not that they think or that they're going to treat it the same way or not. And then there's simple ones like do fizz I buzz. And it's not that easy, but, you know, like ones that are easy. I'm like, oh, my God, I haven't done that forever. You know, my last three years have been gluing together cloud architecture patterns and then automating that, not writing these novel programs. And so uh, it's kind of that balance. And what I'm looking for right now is. I'm sitting here by myself every day at home <laughs> trying to build a, a structure of like, where do I need to put my, you know, where do I need to divvy up my attention and resources? Obviously just practicing and iterating, but then system design seems like it's like read a design. Like I, I, it, that seems hard to practice yeah. for me. Unless it's like I, a I, I agree. Problem. Makes sense. And I'll be frank with you. As, as I said, you, you can tell like, even as an interview, I'm not going to sit here and tell you interviews are perfect. They're honestly bullshit. But what you're going to try and do here is give structure to the chaos because that's essentially what it is. And then here's where the reality I'll give you. And I, I think, you know, fortunately, you experience, so you get it. It also comes with an element of luck. Some interviews are just crap. And when you encounter those kinds, really, there isn't any way to really escape it other than just making sure you do your part and then hope for the best. But under the assumption that most interviews will be good, we'll try and structure it and, uh, you know, I, I will try and structure the process for you such that you'll always show the most, uh, show the most uh, knowledge in any interview. But even before that, I wanted to at least give you an initial proposal and reiterate on this before, you know, because I also want to make sure we use this session to at least go through one exercise so that I get a feel of where you are. So we can maybe have this first session and maybe the second session focus on coding interviews and okay. then the third session can focus on design interviews and then on the feedback side especially on the second session i can make it system design heavy and then for this first two sessions because they're coding interviews i can focus more so on 
uh, what do you call it? Like in this case, we can do like more of a mentorship just to get a sense of where you are. So it would be tricky. And then I'll give you resources for the second one. It will be more of like practice, but under the assumption that you'll have had the time to at least go through the process just to get a sense of uh, how comfortable you are with the process. Then I'll make sure I come in with curate, a curated list of resources, recommend them for the third session, then we can have that. And throughout that time, I'm assuming they've added you to the Slack channel. I will be available in case you have uh, questions, basically, if you want to like uh, ideate or if you think some resources are not clear, we can do that. Uh, we can just uh, connect async and I'll be happy to share any other resources you need. What do you think of this plan? That sounds good. Because honestly, it's just getting and doing some of these things mm -hmm. and talking through it. I know what Slack is, but I didn't know there was an interview in IO Slack. She will be able to uh, add you to this channel where you can connect with not just me, but there's actually a bunch of other interviews there too who usually share resources and not just interviews, but also candidates. So you can even get a sense of uh, success stories, what some other people looked at in case, let's say, you're not just interested in Microsoft. You, you can even ask questions on go the Google process, et cetera. So there, there is a lot of game tools that you can even get insight into who's hiring, uh, what the heck was asked, if uh, that's ever posted. And, you know, it, it's just a good place to be in, especially if you're in that zone where you could potentially interview. Okay. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah. All right. And then I have a silly, uh, because uh, for this one, you're going to focus on uh, coding. Do you mind selecting the language you're going to use? That, that way, I can just uh, quickly probe you on this. Interesting. Uh, uh, did this create right. all this? Okay. And I'll ask, I, I'll ask you, this is literally a preference question because uh, I've always realized this funny thing about my candidates. So I give you two questions. This is question number one. You don't have to solve it yet. Uh, that's question number one. And then the second question, give me one second. Do -do -do. Where the heck is this? And just trying to, uh, it's uh, it's very straightforward. I just want to get a sense of: Do you prefer questions with long descriptions, or are you usually the kind who gets stumped when there's too much information there, or do you like prefer quick, straight up? You know, uh, this is the prompt in two sentences. Here is an example. Get started. I guess I'm indifferent. I don't mind longer ones. I mean, I'll sit there and parse it longer. It just depends, on, like, if they want if the exercises for me to pick out details. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. So these are two examples I was essentially adding here. So with this here, you can see it's slightly different, but it's shorter. So the reason I'm asking this is because I've met candidates who are really good, but the moment you do this for them, they're like, freaking hell, what's going on? And so typically, I usually want to know where a candidate is comfortable before we even start. That way, we can even look at, let's say, breaking down the problem even before delving into it. But Okay, in your case, I'll keep, because uh, we can't like shorten time, so let's try and attempt this second one, because I want to also get a sense of how you go through an interview. So let's assume we're in interview mode, and I'm going to keep track of some notes and just get a sense of how you go through the typical uh, coding interview. So let's, you know, let's take an attempt, uh, make an attempt to solve this, see how you go through it, and I'll provide some more examples. And then on my side, I'll take some notes and ask questions as we go. Is that okay? Okay. Um... All right, buckle up, right. I guess. Um, already. Okay, so given the head of a linked list, reverse the nodes of the list K at a time. Reverse the nodes of list K at a time and return the modified list at a time. K is a positive integer and is less than or equal to the length of the linked list. If the number of nodes is not a multiple of K, then, then left out nodes in the end should remain as it is. May not alter the value of the list nodes, only the nodes themselves may be changed. Okay, let me try to parse this again. So, so given that, so, so far we know, like, given a linked list, wow, is that caps lock on? Linked list. Reverse the nodes of linked list K. So linked list K, right? So I'm mm -hmm. assuming it's called K, linked list. So input is K, a linked list. And then the class is, is it, is it coming as a head or K equals two? Okay, so 
given the head of a linked list, reverse the nodes of list K at a time. Oh, reverse K at a time. So reverse it. So when you mean K at a time here, K at a time meaning three, like if K is two, okay, two at a time, reverse two at a time, meaning, so if it's one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. Okay, so you're taking it, you're evaluating K nodes at a time and swapping their positions in place. Um, Precisely. And you can, you can split it into K size chunks, right? Let's do that. Yeah. K is a positive and integer is less that. than or equal to the length of the list. So this is a guaranteed K is a positive integer and less than or equal to the length of the linked list. If the number of nodes is not a multiple of K, then the left out nodes in the end should remain as is. Okay, so if it's not a multiple of K, the left out nodes are at the end of the list. Like uh, you determine what the end is, right? So in this case, the length of this one was four, well, one, two, three, five. And so the fifth one mm -hmm. stayed in place because it's not a multiple of two in this case, right? Um, so three, well, hold on. So is that, if the number of nodes is not a multiple of K, then the left out nodes. So what a left out node. I think okay. you can, if you look at the second example, it might be better for that analysis. Uh, constraints slash uh, constraints and definitions here. Okay, let's just work on definitions for a quest. Oh, quick. So K is positive. We know that uh, left out nodes in this case are linked list nodes. That that are not multiple of k. So position position of linked list nodes, right? Is that what that means? Is that like k, number of nodes not a multiple of k? Then the left out nodes. So trying to define left out nodes here, meaning the the k uh, or the nth uh, node. Uh, Go ahead. I was going to look at this. Uh, if we look at the example on line fourteen. So if we just pick, let's say, the first three, because our K is three, mm -hmm. that's okay. We can easily reverse those. Now, for the next three, by virtue of our input not being a multiple of K, it means that we'll always have that residual set of elements, which are not really adding up to the count K. And when we have those, and an example is this four, five, we just leave them as is. So we will reverse three to one, and then leave the four five as is. Do you see that? Yes. Got it. Yeah. And so oh. yeah, if we were to generalize this, if we had let's say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and our k is three. What will the output for that be by the way? Assuming I just take a stab at it. You know, print out the output for me here. Oh, you, okay. Hello. Can you hear me? Hmm? Yes, I can hear you now. Yeah. Okay. Some reason I lost you for a second there. Yeah. So you're saying, tell me what this would be, right? What would the output essentially be? Exactly. Yep. Okay, so if K is three, K is essentially defining our K, it's defining our window size of what our window size for reversal. Um, so K three, build a window size three and reverse those and then mm -hmm. continue to the next. So, and once we've reached three, we reverse those and then we kind of reset the window and then go to the next, you know, build another window if we can, so oh. on and so forth, right? Okay. So this one would be uh, three, two, one. And then, 
six, five, four, and then seven, eight would remain the same because we weren't able to build a window of what is this right here? This open. You're talking me that was this your uh, example for output? This empty oh, list here. Okay. Okay, just remove that. Yeah. Can you okay. It? So seven and eight would remain in their place because we weren't able to build a window that satisfied the constraint of our window size, right? So that's kind of the grouping there. Um, so you may not alter the values in the list nodes, only the, the nodes themselves. And so only the nodes themselves, meaning you can change what they're pointing to and what they're, you know, you change the order. You're not changing values. I can't like assign node one's value three and swap their values in place. I have to be updating the pointers of the linked list um, to different spots. Okay, and so from what I kind of like at a high level, it's going to be uh, establish a window for reversal. Reverse elements within window. And then continue and then so, and then build the next window. And then so base cases here, are like some things we need to think about is start reversal only. Okay, so start a reversal once we've established the window size matches. So K is three, K is five, K at a time. So we always know that we're going to have our minimum window size is, sizes has to be K. So we can't start reversal until we've re released or we've reached a K. So window size equals K or min window size. So established window for reversal list of K nodes, reverse elements within the window, and then continue to next window building. Uh, There's probably a better way to say that. Continue, okay, reverse elements within the window, window start, move window, move window to end of reversed or completed window. Okay. Start new window after reversed or completed. So this one's more established window for reversal. List of K nodes, reverse elements within the window, and then iterate. Okay. So other things we need to think about. So K, you know, if I'm not going to, do you want me to worry about like if the K is too long, like if it's greater than the length of the linked list? No. If the number of nodes is not a multiple of K. Okay. So if it's the same length of the, no, as the list, then we got to reverse the whole mm -hmm. list. Um, Precisely. If K. And we, we've highlighted that on line five, right? Yeah. And it should remain as is. Okay. So basically it's a walking win like it's a sliding window and we reverse within that window. Um the question is so is the head so the head data type do we want to define a link list like data type class, like for does it point to the next value or we're just like what is head here? Is it just a list? Right. So yeah, I, I'll, uh, initially, I was going to give you the freedom to define how it looks like, but uh, for now, let's assume we're going to have a class and oh, shoot, class node, right? And here, our node will basically be an init, and we have self, and then val, and then next. And then next can be initialized as none, same case with the val. And so, if you want to define things in the context of this, uh, can do that and then self dot what the heck is that all right and then self dot next this can be a node and so if you want to build up a list by the example we have above what you can do is simply create let's say head one here and you're going to say node right here and you can say what's the value for that that's one right 
and then head one dot next is equals to node what uh, that will be two etc so you can build them up this way if you want it's really up to us to decide how we want to uh, want to go by it and then from there just operating with head one should be the first example so this is the kind of input you might get okay alternatively yeah yeah, if, yeah. If this is too much, you can even just use tuples because literally it's an enumerated list. You simply need to know what's next. So, so long as you work around the inputs list, that's totally fine. Like I'll give you the freedom to select how you expect your input. Okay, yeah, this sounds good. And so vowels is gonna be uh, just integers. It's fun. That's okay, input received had one equals, okay. So let's say this. And this is going to be a head. This is class node, and then k is an integer, and we return a node. All right, because we're going to just be returning the same list. If it makes it easier, you don't have to even do the type checking. Uh, I, I love it, but uh, I know it usually consumes a lot, a lot of time. Yeah, so we're going to say, you know, yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. So, there's like, obviously, check K versus length. Well, we don't know the length because we don't have a, okay. That's the other thing. We won't know it unless we build it, right? Because it's just a, a link yeah, list yeah. type. Okay. So the condition to watch out for length of list versus k while we're walking. Okay, so let's do this. So current window equals zero. Oops. And what am I going to have to keep track of when I'm doing this? Probably the, the node, current node. Okay, so if not, head return none. We know that. Okay. Okay, and so what do I want to do? I said I'm gonna build a window, and I gotta I gotta essentially walk down this node until I've established the window length. And so mm -hmm. uh, maybe a quick suggestion: rather than thinking of a window, what if you had pointers? Like if yeah, it's like two, two pointers pieces. of the other one, right? So it's like window yeah. beginning. So it's like window, oh, let's just do window left window right equals window left equals head window right equals head dot next. To start, is, is it always gonna is it always gonna be two of them only, or how is it gonna be like? If there's only gonna be two uh, pointers, because yeah, because if you just do window left and window right, you're considering two at a time, right? Yes, but I mean that's a, like so I'm thinking about if there's a window, right? So mm -hmm. window is is kind of constructed like left. And then, right, and then there's mm -hmm. values inside that window. Let me point at those. But, so we want to walk the right pointer until we've reached K. And then from there, uh, reverse the link, man, linkless stuff. It's been a minute. <laughs> um, we want to build this window up and then walk. Um, 
once we've established the window size, then we start reversing in place. Or is that the truth? Or do we want to keep reverse? So maybe I'm thinking of something differently. So I don't really want to reverse until I know that we have a big enough window, right? And so exactly. that's why I don't want to reverse as we go. But I could. What is the problems with that, I though? What were you going to say? Like, assuming, let's say we are not, because that's a very optimal approach, and I really like that you're thinking of that, but let's even start high level. Assuming that you have free range of memory, like, is there, like, you know, do you even have to, like, do it in place? Assuming I gave you, uh, let's say, a list here, a list of size K, right? Like, I'll, I'll give you an auxiliary space of size K, let's say, a window here. And this, it's going to be a list and you can only fill it to size K. Can that come in handy, especially when it comes to tracking what you're seeing? If we knew that the length of the list ahead of, like, I'm, I'm sorry, if you gave me what? Like, yeah, so I'm going to give you, okay. I'm going to give you auxiliary space uh, that you, and here what you can do is fill it up to size K. So as you go through the window, or as you go through the linked list, you feel free to make copies, or at least to throw some of these nodes into that window. And then as soon as it hits your size K, do something with it, and then keep going. Yeah, I mean, I I guess, that, yeah, we could use another, we can fill it up. We could fill up the auxiliary window with the nodes we encounter, and when it's size K, then walk through that. Right? Mm -hmm. So. Exactly. Okay, I think I agree with that. So let's do Hmm. I'm just thinking about it, sorry. So while I you see this is where I start thinking in my head instead of typing it out. So uh Let's just do what you just said. So let me create a, so I'm going to say window left and window right. So if we did it with what you did, I'd say while, you know, walk to next and push it onto the window list. Mm -hmm. um, so while window, well, while current window length, It's less than or equal to K. So walk to the right and add. So uh, let's start here. We know we need the first one. So window dot append head. Okay. Start here and then say. Window dot append head dot next. Or not head. We need to say should I be tracking this? Let's just say temp. We have window left and window right. Uh mm -hmm. let's say current node equals head, window right equals head. Why am I doing that? Current node dot next. So I could say instead of current window length, I'm going to say window dot length. The length of window is less than or equal to k. Append the next current node is head window right. I'm going to just window append current node while the length of window is less than or equal to k. Append this 
next unknown. Current node equals current node dot next. Uh, Okay, so let's let's pick up what you're doing here. So you're checking for the length. Let's separate these two out and also do this. So you have current node and you also have the window. Let's actually also bring that up. I'll put the comments at the top that we we have this code all in one place. So you have the window, and as you go through the window, you're appending the current node dot next. And what you're doing then is saying, uh, well, length of window is less than or equals to k. You keep performing this action, but as soon as you hit the size k, what's going to happen then? And then we need to not yet done the yeah. yeah. So so maybe if I may, if I may ask, even if we were not doing anything. So at the moment, what we're doing is we're simply adding to the list. And are you familiar with this syntax, just out of curiosity? Like if I was to do this, because you know you can do dot reverse, but I'll just give you a quick. Yeah, uh, we could redo that, and then one. we could reverse that node, and then step back through and update each pointer, right? Reverse. Exactly. Yeah. Alternatively, you can even just loop from right to left, right? Loop right to left, and that should also give you the same result. And quick tip on that. Because you're tracking your current node separately from whatever is in the window, you still have the next one after you've done the reversal. So even if you adjust the next, you still have the next node to start with at hand. So you can easily keep going. Yeah. You see that? Yeah. All right. So, okay. I'm just trying to wrap it up in my head. Like I was going to try to do it all with uh, just nodes and next and not just reverse the list itself but that that's fine too so and see this is what i need to work on too is me sitting here and getting locked up and listening slash not listening trying to think of the solution while you're talking about it so um yeah, it's okay and full transparency here's the thing the reason why i even suggested the window thing is it's actually complementary to the same exact approach you have. Because once you have that window approach done, optimizing it to get it to purely working on, uh, what do you call it? Uh, to purely working with pointer adjustments, it's pretty straightforward. Like combining the reversal as well as the uh, iteration process without needing the window is easy. Okay. Yeah. So, what am I thinking of here though? So, okay, Let's, let me start it over again. So, yeah, I like what you suggested, and then let me try to re-erase my thought here. Um, let's start both. We know, okay, so we know that we're going to start at the head. We have the first one done, right? And mm -hmm. so we need to build, we need to keep going until we've reached uh, K. Essentially, right? So let me just, uh -huh. we'll keep this up here. So we have, these are not really useful at the moment. Um, so we have temp head, and then we have a, a window head, and those both equal a node. Well, they both equal. What am I thinking about? Let me head sub this head. Oh, wait. So here, this is what I can do. Temp head, window head equals a new node, and we can set it to what are our constructors up there? We're going to say value of zero just for now. And then its next is going to be head, right? The given head that we were given. Okay. So we're going to start with a temp head pointing at head, that given head, okay? And so now we can do a basic loop and move the sublist head to the right on head.next until we've reached size k. So what, like, we don't really care about, so for whatever in range, start from one, because we're already there, to k? Might be K minus one. I have to do the math in my head. 
we can then say window head. That might not be the best name for this, but equals window head dot next. So we're walking to the right until we reach K. Can I print stuff out on this? Yep, uh, we sh yeah, we should have, uh, yeah, the console on the right, it should allow us to print stuff. So if you want to run, feel free to do that, yeah. Is it console on the right? Yep, so if, no. let's say we were to do a print here, I'll just do print and say test. If you run this, I don't know if it will work. Where's the run button at anyway? Oh, there it is. Oh, uh, top left, yes. And so we should be I don't see the consoles. Yeah, I'm actually weirded out. For some reason, it's not outputting anything. I don't know what's going on with it. Oh, um, did we mess anything up up here? No, 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 no. Okay. Okay, I don't know what's going on with Coda, but maybe maybe they disabled running, but I'll ask them uh, after this. Uh, we can uh, just... Okay, well, we, we'll, we'll go with, now. let's assume... I think it range in K it's exclusive, so that will still give us a, the number of steps. So we this will have built our window, build first window to get started. And once we've uh, now we got to reverse it. Um, so now what do we need to do? Okay, so this built our window, and now I need to go back and reverse it. Okay, I was kind of on a, a, a path, but I've kind of lost it. <laughs> so, did right. this make sense? So, like you, you, you are correctly building the window. So, the one part maybe I might ask here, you see what you're saying? So, we're saying while length of window is k. How about we do this? So I'll just add a simple trick here. So, we know we have our auxiliary space, and I'm also going to do counter here, right? And I'm going to initiate counter as zero. And now what I'll say here is while counter is less than len, uh, in this case, uh, while counter is one second. Okay, one second. For some reason, my kid is crying. Let me just tell my wife. To You're good. Up. Ed, take your time. No worries. <laughs> Hey, sorry for that. Uh, still here with me? Yes. Yeah, I he was panicking. I don't know what was going on, so I just needed to check in on that. All right, so I was saying, if we had this counter with us here, right? And so we use this counter as a size. We don't have to do that window check for that. Now, what I'm proposing here is we can do a quick scan just to get a sense of how many elements we have, because it's not really going to cost us, right? So if we want, we can do that quickly. So if you want to measure the size of the, uh, what do you call it? The size of the linked list here. The downside is it has also some complexity considerations, but with that, you can leverage this to make sure that, and here you can say LL length, because nothing is preventing us from doing this. So we can do this alternatively, even without a counter, we can just say while true, right? Uh, so do it as an infinite loop, and then as, or actually we can even say while can node, not even, uh, they call it can node dot next. So this tells us that we have a node somewhere in the linked list and our car node is gonna be initiated, let's say as head. And we keep doing this so long as there's something. And then within this, you can even then say if len window, and here's I'll say if len window is equals to K, that's when we maybe call uh, reverse. Reverse. Uh, reverse, let's say window, and then we pass in our window. Reverse window, we pass in our window, and then maybe we do something else. 
uh, window equals to that. We reset it. So reverse and then reset. Reverse and then here we reset. So these are two uh, two possibilities. I, I, I'll I'll still let you like uh, keep going with it. But what I'm saying here is, if it's equals to this, we basically perform the reversal action, and it's up to you to figure out how it will look like. Else, we add to the window and we keep moving our car node dot next. So by yeah. the same logic, it shows. Yeah. Basically, that. You yeah. See I'm that? Yeah, that's tr right. Exactly. You I mean you captured what I said up here earlier. It's like establish the window and then reverse and then start, you know, otherwise exactly. keep building the window. Okay. Yeah, and this is me not well one practicing and then I guess I should follow what I wrote out, you know, kind of describe because if I describe the pseudocode, it kind of makes sense, right? So it's like exactly. build the window. Once we have the window, reverse it. Otherwise we gotta keep building the window. And then if we don't get to a window of the correct size, then then we know we can't do it. And then the question is, is yeah, reverse window and then reset. Okay. This is actually better than one. So this one, I was like, I built the window and then I had to reverse it, but then I didn't really know how to continue forward, how to keep going. So. All right. And I'll yeah. do this. Uh, I want to, I want to make a note. You see, I have this, random function we've not used before and you know I, I know you've you know you've done this coding interviews before so you've had sometimes if you have some functionality that you're not share, uh, sure yet of how it will work just use uh, we call them ghost functions or whatever it is that you can feel later and so what i usually do actually in interviews is if i need such a function i usually define either as an internal function but you can do this and say mm -hmm. pass right yeah and so Keep with the primary logic and then fill it out later. And here we can even say our car node equals to head, right? Just to get us started. So if you do this, once you at least have this uh, have this section of the logic done, it's easy to come back to fill this in. Because then I can go in and work on just the reversal instead of focusing on that with everything else, right? So like make some stub functions. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Yep. But now, okay. So I think, uh, you know, typically at least uh, with an interview, that's kind of the whole length. I know we have about 10, I'll probably add like a five, maybe 10 mi minutes after this, but if you want, uh, you know, we can skip the implementation bit. I feel like I picked up a lot of signal on that, but I also want to get a sense of the analysis side of things. So as you go through this code, we don't have to code now, just, uh, you know, pick up that your, your verbal strength, uh, strength is really strong. I can tell that you're thinking of the correct things. So what's the analysis for this? And if you were to actually optimize this a bit further, how would you do that? Um, I'd remove the need to, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, how would I optimize this further? If space-wise would not be, would be just doing an in-place pointer updates, like build that window like I was initially mm -hmm. without having to allocate, you know, a temporary holding pattern for it and then reverse and mm -hmm. then continue moving forward. So being in-place reversal without having to store mm -hmm additional nodes like the temporary head or anything like that, not, not allocating any of that stuff. Um, All right. The, uh, like, so yeah, space optimization would be that, but the other one would be, would be uh, focusing more on effective use of the, the pointer. So it's like, and, and avoiding multiple passes on the list. Cause right there I was kind of, Allocating a new node to just temporarily build a window, um, mm -hmm. and then go reverse it. So I could I could identify the uh, in a single pass, combine the identification of the sublist, reverse it, and then update to the next node. I just I, I, well, as I'm saying is avoid the extra allocation of extra nodes in a, a temporary storage area for space complexity, and that also means avoiding the multiple passes on the list. So if this list is large and the window K is defined as something extremely large, then me doing multiple passes on it's just throwing iterations out the window. Uh, so it's, mm -hmm. I still think my establishment of the list node, like building the original window is good, but I don't necessarily like the allocation of a new node. So if I were to package it up, I would say avoid it allocating temporary nodes and I would try to traverse the head list, link list 
in one pass of so doing it in place. Uh, obviously, yeah. you can kind Maybe. of throw out temporary storage like pointers, but or you just have a double link list. But that's not the point. So, um, <laughs> I was, was going to ask you though: Do you think we can really avoid doing at least two passes? Because we have two things. We have two key operations here where we are going through the main list, so that's an inevitable of and we have to go from start to end. It's a linked list, so that's kind of inevitable. And then the reversal, the reversal of the pointers, that's also somewhat inevitable. That's exactly what we need from the question, right? Yeah. Uh, so by virtue of that, what's the minimum complexity you can get really? I, I mean, in terms of traversals over the list, I mean, I can... Mm -hmm. Minus the K, like we know when we hit a certain win like length, we can like disregard like a list that's longer than or doesn't meet our window size constraints. But I would say, I mean, how many passes are we going to do here? I would say it's kind of close to uh, O N squared. <laughs> no, that's not true. Like I'm trying to. Uh, if, so think about it. so by your window approach. So if we were to think of it as steps. So it's like we are taking a big K step and then we are looping back through K to make sure they are reversed. And then we take another big K step and then another K step back, of which, you know, K will always be less than, uh, less than uh, N, where N is the size of the array. So it's like a big K step and then a sweep back to reverse them. I mean, it's going to be over N, N. Yeah, I mean, we're going to just exactly. go over linear time. I don't know if we can make it much better than that, but. Mm. Precisely. Well, and that's uh, that's actually, uh huh. Yeah, I, I mean, we could you could make space complexity improvements, but I don't think time in terms of like we're going to be traversing the whole list because we don't know when the end of the node is because we got to continue to try to build the window, right? Precisely. And to to your point on that, uh, another quick tip on this: any time you really identify the best complexity you have, don't worry about the number of like uh, loops through. Like in this case two loops, three loops, so long as it's not going to affect the final complexity, of which we know in our case it's going to be O of N time-wise, then an extra loop really doesn't affect much in terms of final analysis. The one thing your interview will be interested though, uh, interested in, though, is are you actually aware of the complexity effects? Are you even aware of the best complexity you can get? And in yeah. your case, I can tell you clearly have a sense of where we're going, but don't be afraid of solutions if they uh, don't affect the final complexity. But that said, I think um, what I want to do with you right now is kind of flip the uh, flip the book here. So if I was to ask you, looking back, I know you can identify areas where you think you did well, and I know you can identify areas where you think you can improve on. Maybe just run me through this, and then I'll run you through what I took notes of, and then we can come up with a, an action plan for this. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you want to run me through that? Yeah. Like, what do you think you did well? Oh, okay. Sorry, I, th I misheard the ordering. I thought you were going to run me through. Okay, what I think I did well, well you know, let's, I do believe I broke down the problem coherently and identified a problem, like a kind of a pattern, whether or not you want to call it two pointers or a window or what have you, but I did identify the kind of the high level close handed steps that need to be taken and the constraints. Mm -hmm. So I guess decomposing the problem correctly. Uh, we talked about how are we going to represent the, the data structure itself, but um, kind of the close handed issues of what we are given and what we are expected to return and establishing, or I guess distilling and revisiting some of the definitions, like what does it mean by K? Like what is K actually representing? And then what is a left out node? And so, so some of those ed edge cases right there is what, I did identify well. What I didn't identify well was actually putting pseudocode into a, even at a basic level, like a graduated implementation. Like I liked how you did the stub, but I, you know, I should have been thinking very similar to that. Like, okay, what, how do I just break it out into discrete steps that I identified in comments? Like, can I do the same thing? So uh, <laughs> my ideas and the identification of the constraints and stuff are good. Uh, I didn't necessarily think of some test cases. I could have spent a little bit more time on that. Like, what if I get, like, write out the return case for something that's the same. I, I guess I identified it vocally, but like a list length of 
size k that we find, but we don't know the length of the list. So I could have spent a little more time on test cases and um, examples instead of just taking the, the given ones uh, to demonstrate that. But with the given ones, I thought I thought I did okay with identifying the problem's components, putting it into the language I did not necessarily follow through on. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. And so at least uh, to reverse uh, in, uh, in this case, so let me run you through my feed feedback. So, you know, I know you also have a sense of what interviews will typically be looking for. So communication is one pillar that I'll be focused on. I want to make sure I'm keeping up with you. Then there's the technical skills and then there's the problem solving skills. On your side, it was easy to pick up the communication as being extremely strong. I think that's probably your biggest strength for what I went through here. So I could easily tell that you know how to speak to interviewer even during the process of coding. I know a lot of candidates struggle quite a lot when they're coding and they're supposed to speak at the same time. It's usually not really fun. And so in your case, I'm not too worried about that. That said, I have some suggestion strategies because I feel like sometimes you got lost in these rabbit holes and you also identify them where you know you start doing something and you get lost in your head. And so one uh, pattern that at least I try to use here is if I'm speaking, let's say at most one minute, and my interviewer has not come, uh, has not like you know interjected or told me to consider another perspective, I bring them in myself. I ask them, does this make sense to you? Uh, are we headed in the right direction? Is this, let's say, you know, depending on the context, you can ask them a question. It's more of a filler question, but you want to make sure that they're in the loop. And typically doing this repeatedly also helps you because you avoid going down rabbit holes, especially if they're wrong, because you'll find that occasional evil interviewer who frankly will just not tell you. They'll let you go down the wrong, uh, wrong path and then at the end you're here stuck because you're not implementing the correct thing. So maybe learning how to time box yourself to a degree there would help you because then you just stop yourself and make sure hey even before i go on further does this make sense to you and if they say yes then you know assuming it's wrong then at least they're confused alongside you right and you're not the only one going down a bad, uh, bad rab uh, rabbit hole yeah like sense? don't go down the path without telling them what path i'm going down really like be more of a guide on my thought process rather than just saying trust me exactly. <laughs> okay. Precisely. Yeah. So making sure they're in the loop of it. And then the other thing I was thinking about here is we, um, at, at least in terms of communication, there is a lot more strategy we can use in terms of what we're packing into the communication. And an example is how we present initial proposals for the solution. Okay. So in your case, you gave me the idea, you wrote it down. And here's the thing. As an engineer, I like writing things down. But my Lord, it sucks when it comes to interviews because they take long. And you might find yourself trying to document a very exhaustive approach and it's taken 10 minutes. And then, boom, you have maybe 25 minutes at most to solve the problem. So what I usually advise my candidates is don't write down the step-by-step -step process. I realize you know, a lot of candidates tend to want to have that exhaustiveness, but don't do that. Rather, word it out. So for the process, word it out. And then if you must write, summarize the approach using at most, let's say, one or two lines each. So it's like loop thread or loop list, and then maybe build window, something like that. If you document too much, it takes too long. Now, that's okay. the one thing I would advise you do right from the get-go is as soon as you've proposed a solution, also talk about its complexity, because it's usually fairly clear. So propose a solution write its complexity next to it. And the reason is you then won't have to do it at the end. You immediately get those points checked. You have some technical details checked. Does this make sense? Yeah. So be a little more high level, write out the basics, but not every detailed step. Uh, you know, like if we look exactly. at line 40 through 42, mm -hmm. that could have been a lot of what I said, right? Outside of Precisely. everything else. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then identify the make complexity it, uh -huh. as I'm doing it, right? Because mm -hmm. if, if we're flying and by the even make it better. Go ahead. Yeah. To even make it better, if you want, if you want to uh, kind of like even showcase testing, you can actually talk about your solution in light of one of the examples. So as you propose a solution, if you have to delve deep, test it out with an example. Now that's the part where 
if you document it's totally fine and that's why i usually advise my candidates if you let's say want to you can like write an example here and on line 45 i'll give an example there so let's say one two three four five six I usually advise the use of these things, uh, hats. I don't know if they're called hats. So you can say, this is my P1, right? P1 and then P2 somewhere else. And then you just move them around. So you can say that maybe this is our P2 for the next pointer. And in our case, we know that the window should be a size K. So let's say size uh, K is three. So if you just do this, move it so that, you know, the explanations are animated. So you can tell the interviewer, okay, so in this case, I'm gonna do a couple of things. I'm gonna build up the window. And so you say build window. And then from there, the next step would, of course, entail reverse the window. So reverse if it's size K. So this is kind of the general gist of what I need to do. And then you run through it. So you say, in this case, I'll obviously move P1 until I achieve the window size. So if this window size is three, so it's P1, P2, P3. And then as soon as I hit that, it means I have a window size three, which in this case would look something like one, two, three. So I just reverse it and say, this will be three, two, one. And then from there, I get the P2 to the next level while I still have my window handy and then connect, uh, you know, build it up and then connect it again later on. So kind of using your window as a cache, but also using it to build the rest of the list. So the reason yeah, I'm saying this good. is, yeah. yeah. It's Animating not only, it, yeah. Demonstrating it. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. And here's the thing, it's also showing testing. You wanna show you can test, you wanna show you can debug. And the beauty of it is you're not debugging code. It's a reverse process where you are literally testing your code even before all your logic before you write the code. And the beauty of this is, especially with companies that don't ask you to run the code, you're saving yourself the problem or the trouble of catching bugs as you go, which can sometimes dink your performance. So if your logic is sound, implementation details won't really matter as much. They'll only want to see can you code. In each case, if yes, you're totally fine. Make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Yep. All right. Yeah. Um, the last time I did a lot of these then, interviews, we did it in person on whiteboards. Uh, so this is different now when you can write <laughs> code and test it. So that's also. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. I do prefer the whiteboard days because you didn't have to code everything and nobody expected it, right? Yeah. Now they expect it to run. I'm like, okay. Yeah, so. yeah. Or, or with Google, where they're going to give you a doc. That's yeah. going to be fun. <laughs> so, you know, obviously a lot of this is going to come down to me practicing them talking about mm -hmm. it out loud and animate like illustrating it like you just did correctly in front of them because you know when it's me by myself i can illustrate it to myself but i gotta think about that mm -hmm. for other people indeed and i'm trying to think of like because uh, you know at least with uh, with my uh, mentorships what i usually try to do is work with my candidate to come up with a strategy so in this case especially in the communication bit because i feel as though we both identified that as an area of uh, an area where we need a bit of work and frankly it's, it's hard to work uh, work on unless you're having practice but i feel like i'll not i'll be doing you a disservice if i just told you go practice so we've identified one strategy here where we said limit yourself or time box so it's a two-way combination a two-way strategy here where you have time box and you say at most one minute if you want, you can even break it down by sentences. So you, you know, you can literally time yourself, see how many sentences you're able to get in in about a minute, and then always monitor for that. So you can even do sentence, uh, sentence count. So as you speak through, just evaluate. Have I said like ten sentences in one go, or is it two? At which point you pause. So this could yeah. be another strategy you develop. Yeah. Can you think of any any other strategy here? And then. In terms of how you speak, do you feel like there's something you can more intuitively track? Yeah, well, yeah, being less verbose, I guess. I guess speaking with intention, without, I mean, when you're quiet, sometimes like, are you there? Are you thinking, you know, you want to demonstrate that you're there talking through all your thoughts. But yeah, once I'm on a solution, I guess I should, I should drill down. Like, here's the solution at a high level, like mine. Yep, I, I hear you. And to actually to your point i was yeah. gonna i was gonna say you can even develop strategic uh, strategic pillar words and actually let's let's make that a whole category of it uh, on its own so we can have strategic uh strategic pillars and i know this is probably silly to do this kind of analysis but here's the thing i'm, I'm actually from a country where we speak seven languages so sometimes when you are speaking english you have to even develop robotic ways of uh, communicating things and while it's 
stupid, especially if English is your first language. Sometimes people actually see this and they're like, oh, that's actually helpful. It's good to learn that as a nut rather than just a piece of nature. And my favorite one is, does it make sense? You can tell I use this a lot. Does it make sense? It fits in anywhere, really. Like I can throw it in anywhere and the interviewer will be involved and make, you know, if it makes sense to them, they get involved. Does it make sense to you? Yeah, I did like that aspect of demonstrating it in that it's regard and saying it, yeah. yeah. And there's a lot Does of such make... phrases you can use, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, getting yeah. buy-in, like, am I saying the right thing? Like, this is what I'm saying, track with your expectations here, yeah. Exactly, and I, you, you know, know what I'll do no, here yeah. is, in the feedback form, I'll give you a list of such pillars. And then, of course, you know, you can use one, you can use two so that the conversation sounds more natural. But this is just a speech thing. It's like time boxing yourself and then throwing them in there. I feel like that will help you make sure that you're optimally using the time. Now, here's a, another one that I usually like. It's a bit longer, but uh, is this optimal? Uh, is it optimal enough or should I? Uh, should I look to do better? Should I do better? And, you know, or some variant of this. And uh, the reason I really like this one is it usually gets information out of, your, out of the interviewer. And what's happening here is, in case this person, let's say you proposed an initial approach, it makes sense to them, but in their mind, they know there's a more optimal solution. Even before going down a rabbit hole, if you explicitly ask them this, if they say they're cool, if we could do better, or if they're okay with, like, if they're okay with what you have, they'll say, okay, yeah, that makes sense. But if they, in mind, had like a better solution you could uh, take on, it it would suck if they tell you it's fine, yet they know you could do better. And so this is an indirect way of seeing if you're meeting your interviews mark. So just explicitly or strategically asking them, is this optimal enough, or should I look to do better? If they say, yeah, we could do better, then you know, okay, there must be another solution. So given what I have here, can I improve it? Or maybe can I think of an alternative approach? And this saves you the trouble of starting to code something that's not going to get you the maximum point on the map. Make sense to you? Yeah, that does make sense. And it's it's not like, hey, tell me what to do. It's, it's mm -hmm. asking for guidance, but... And it's also avoiding going down the path and losing that time if they, if you could have, if you could have uh, denied that like thread of thought ahead of time, you would have saved all that time. So mm -hmm. you kind of lost the time if you didn't ask that earlier, right? So like get their input if Precise, possible yeah. without explicitly being like, okay, what next? You know, <laughs> so yeah. Precisely, yeah. Yep. And so, yeah, at least this, uh, you know, you can tell I'm focusing a lot on just improving communication because frankly speaking, I think this bit here, the solution bit, you clearly have an, a sense of the patterns we need to look out for. So what I'll do here is I'll simply curate a list of questions by pattern and you don't have to solve all of them, but I would advise you solve at least, let's say, three questions per pattern. And these patterns are like dynamic programming, the likes of graphs, just to build that comfort. Because once you're, let's say, 10, 15, 20 problems in, typically you realize, okay, in terms of problem solving, I'm in a much better space. And so that's why async practice is more than enough. And then in the interview, it's building the interview skills, not the problem solving skills. Like there's not much that an interviewer can do for the problem solving, which is ironic because I know a lot of candidates expect that they come out of here, they can code better. But no, it's actually the interview that the interviewer can help you with. I feel as though on your side, it's more or less about building that natural progression throughout the interview. And hopefully these things will help or these strategies will help. Now, I know we only have three sessions. I would like to suggest an alternative resource that you can use because you know, I don't think it will make sense to pay for more. I, honestly, I feel for you three, maybe to five at most sessions such as this will be good to get to that space because I trust your technical skills. But if you have to practice, either use the platform. I know you've seen the free sessions, right? You know, you can sign up for like free sessions, so either to host them, also to like go through them as an interviewee. Have you seen those? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I'd advise try and actually run some interviews. Ironically, you can learn a lot by being the interviewer and it's less pressure. Who knows? If you find people who are actually good, you can see what they're doing and if, you know, maybe pick it up. Alternatively, good point. Yeah, I thought about that. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, so that's one thing I would advise you to do. So use this platform, conduct some interviews, be on the you know be on the hot seat yourself, try and gain as much insight as possible, and obviously use this as a chance to practice and then do the opposite, be interviewed. I feel as though once you're maybe three to five such interviews in, you'll be a lot more conf- uh, confident and a lot more comfortable getting from step A to step Z, where you have the solution and even if let's say there are still weaknesses here and there, you'll still have that practice to go through. And obviously watch example interviews, which there are a lot out there, just to kind of just see what other people are doing, because all these questions are going to be repeated. I'm hoping yeah. this is making okay. sense to you. Yeah. It is. All right. So, yeah, I'll cu- what I'll do after this, after the after the session, I'll actually curate a list of uh, resources as well as some other strategic pillars, like things like this. So in terms of communication, I'll basically give very precise feedback on areas where I think you can improve on. And then I'll paste that uh, for you in the feedback form. And then, as I said, uh, please ping Liz. We'll actually add you to the Slack channel. And then we can also connect async from there if you have any questions. But at least before we end, I don't know if you have any other last questions for me or anything else uh, you want to discuss. Uh, I guess scheduling frequency. I know we have three or something. I put one up for this weekend at some point. I don't know if how spacing works or I guess preferences on spacing between these things. Obviously, practicing and stuff in between is my own uh, accord. But Absolutely. what do you think is effective here? I was going to advise, let's put at least two weeks between this session and the next session. Like, I, you know, I feel as though you won't have enough time to have meaningful practice between this and the next one. So two, especially if you, you know, if, if it's not urgent, if you don't have interviews coming in tomorrow, then let's maximize how much impact you can get from just three sessions. Make sense? Okay. It sounds good. I'll go look at the okay, schedule so, and make adjustments. Perfect. Yeah, and I have a, a fairly open schedule for dedicated coaching. It's my priority. So, you know, there will be a lot okay. of time. And if you need more time, again, reach out to me and I'll make sure I uh, free up space. Okay. okay. That sounds great. I appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah. And it was really nice to meet you, James. And, you know, I trust you on the right track. Honestly, I'm not too worried about you. It's just refining this because you clearly have what it takes. It's just, you know, I usually tell people if you're going to build a huge robot and you're starting from a place where you have everything there, you just need to assembly them, you're good. And that's exactly what we yeah. have here. Clearly, you have the technical Weird. bits. Clearly, you have the engine, yeah. right? You have to build it up, <laughs> right? Yeah, got to re- rework that muscle out because it's it atrophies pretty quickly. So, for sure, yeah. But okay. I have the confidence in you. You're gonna do well after we're done this. But yeah, all right then. Uh, have a good day. I'm gonna drop off for now, and yeah, keep an eye on the feedback form. I'll present all the resources I have for you. Okay. Great. Sounds great. I appreciate it. All right. All right. Thank you.